So, ta-da, there was that. Now I'm gonna pray, and we will uh, get into the message that I had pre-prepared, not the message that we just did because I wanted to right there. So, Father, I just thank you for your word, and I thank you that as we spend time in your word this morning that you, uh, you edify us and you speak to us and you do amazing things in our hearts today. Lord, we trust you. We trust that you will do just a beautiful work in each of us today in Jesus' name. And everyone says, Amen. all right. So, message starts like this. The other day, um, I come home from work, I check the, the mailbox where the people send you uh, letters and mail and things. And I found a letter from uh, my insurance company, which I love. And um, it was a bill. So exciting. It was a car insurance bill, and I opened it up, and it was 25% more than it was last year. And I thought, we haven't wrecked. We haven't filed a claim. You've got to be kidding me. Right? And so that hurt my heart. <laughs> hurt my wallet. And um, uh, I think there's, there's a new phrase. It's called uh, financial dysphoria. Right, and um, so I sat down with my wife. We're like sitting at the kitchen table, or whatever. And I, I sit there and I, I say, "Man, everything is just more expensive." Have you, have you guys seen that? Yes. Right? Everything's just more expensive. And I realized here's 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 the the point of it. I realized that mathematically that is accurate, but emotionally I was speaking from a place of fear and not a place of faith. And the Holy Spirit checked me on that, right? Everything is more expensive, but do you trust me? Everything is more expensive. Are you making wise decisions? Why are you speaking out of a place of fear? And that's what the Holy Spirit spoke to me as I was sitting at my uh, little kitchen table. And then, um, later on that evening, I sat down and picked up the book, and I began to read a passage that I'm going to read a specific verse to you. 2 Corinthians 4.13 said this. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. And since we have the same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. And I felt like in that moment the Holy Spirit said, uh-huh. See? And, and the point of what I want to spend time looking at with you guys today is this. If you, don't, if you tune me out from here on, please take this nugget. There is an undeniable relationship between your faith and your mouth. There is an undeniable relationship between what you believe and the words that you speak. Okay, and so I want to take some time and, and talk about that because we're at a we're at a time in history where inflation is crazy, and we're getting ready to go into if we're not already in a political season where everyone makes friends, and we're excited about that. But um, a, lot, a lot of tension out there in the world on political junk, and um, what I believe influences what I speak. And I cannot separate the two. And if everything that comes out of my mouth is negative, that is a signal that there's something wrong in my, my heart. If everything I speak is doom, despair, and agony on me, and that's a song, right, from Hee Haw? Right? Doom, despair, and agony. If everything I speak is that, then that tells me or tells everyone in the room that my, my heart is not full of faith. And we need to be people that we're full of faith and we're full of the word. And so what, what ends up happening is if our heart is negative, then our words are negative. And then our negative words continue to bring down our heart and we get into this, this doom cycle, spiral, into negativity that just communicates to everyone around us that, hey, we just really don't believe. We don't have faith, we don't have hope, we don't believe God has got this. Whereas if I'm full of the scripture and the scripture is influencing my heart, then it influences my mind, then it influences my words. And I will speak words of edification. I will speak words of exhortation. I will be uplifting. I will be full of hope for the future. 
right? And so, in a way, this, this relationship between faith and words, you are telling everyone where you're at spiritually, right? I've said often that I really wish that we had like a litmus paper that we could test your spirituality like you test a, like a spa. You take a little paper, you stick it in the spa and go, oh, I'm missing, my pH balance is off. I wish we had one of those for the spirit where we could just go, and we go, oh. <laughs> but your words are basically that. I found my litmus test. My litmus test is the words that come out of your mouth. Tell us where you are at spiritually, okay? Because, because I, think, I think we have to recognize that your faith wants to speak, but your fear also wants to speak. Both fear and faith have something to say, and we need to figure this out and, and walk in the faith world, not in the fear world, okay? Faith is a wellspring of life for you. Faith is a wellspring of life. Fear is an ugly undertow. It's going to drag you out to sea. Right? Just, I think, in the last two or three days, there have been four people in Panama City Beach, Florida, Panhandle, that drowned from an undertow. Okay? And beach is dangerous. If it's not sharks, it's undertow, it's whatever. It's sand in your shoes, it's something. But your, your negativity and your doubt end up being an undertow to drag you under. And we need to figure out how to connect our faith and our words so that we're walking more effectively in Christ. Does that all make sense? So look, let's look at a, a scripture. Luke Chapter 6, where it says this, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit, right? You're not walking up some wrinkled up, decrepit, dried up, nothing tree and pulling off a ripe, juicy apple. Not happening. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes. Does anyone here eat figs? Fig Newtons or just figs figs? Okay, whatever, bro. Um, two more power to you. Or grapes from briars. You get blackberries from briars, right? Amen. Some people. Um, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings up evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Oh, there it is. There's an unconnect, undeniable connection between the words that come out of your mouth and the faith that you have in your heart. Because your mouth speaks what your heart is full of. And, and you see this when you, something happens that's like a surprise and you don't have time to plan your words, right? You drop something on your foot. What are you going to say, right? Something, something super negative happens, all of a sudden you're just like, Bleh! out of the negativity of your heart, your mouth has spoken because you don't have time to... And I see this every once in a while, something will happen, people go, you know, cuss a blue streak or swear or whatever word, however you want it. they look at me and they go, oh, sorry. It's like, just work on your heart, bro. Because <laughs> out of the fullness of your heart, your mouth speaks. Now, I think this is important for us because we have to realize in a time of fear, in a time of inflation, in a time of negativity across our country, we have to remember that we are in a spiritual war, and if you speak negatively, you are giving the enemy ammunition to mess up your life, okay? None of you are old enough to remember, but during World War II, there was a campaign, especially around naval bases, which was... Loose lips, 
Loose lips sink ships, right? And they would put that up. And the basic idea is, if you know that this ship is going to that place, don't tell people. Because your unguarded words could lead to a loss of life. Right, and they put posters up all over the place, loose lips, sink ships, and it became a motto, and just, you know, keep your mouth shut, wait, don't talk, right? And I I think if we realize that we are also in a spiritual war, then we can apply that to ourselves. And in the abundance of words, the Bible says, sin will be present. And if we speak a lot of unguarded words, then we're actually giving the enemy, we're we're self-sabotaging. We're giving him something to work on, right? You're sitting at home and you're going like, you know, I just don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. My bills are overwhelming. Oh my, who am I going to do? Oh, Lord. And the enemy is sitting over in the corner going, okay, financial stress. We need to add more financial stress. We need to send them some opportunity that will get them away from church and get them away from the Bible and ruin their marriage, right? Not every opportunity is a good opportunity, people. Okay? And I've seen it. I, oh, yeah, I've been offered this great job. All I have to do is move to Alabama, which is a strike right there. But, <laughs> Brendan, um, you want to say it, don't you? Go ahead. You're not saying it? Okay. Everybody say roll tide. No, don't. That's kidding. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> but but we, I've seen people like, you know, hey, we're going to do this thing. When they move away or they take this great job or they take this great, and then it ruins their marriage and, and destroys their faith. And they, they went after what was shiny and not what was anointed. Okay. And so we, by, by being negative and worried and speaking our worry and speaking our fear, we're giving the enemy a, an opportunity to come in and mess with us a little bit more. And we need to learn that loose lips will sink our spiritual ship. We need to begin to speak faith over stuff in our lives. Your careless blabbering will hurt your life. We good? All right, so let's talk about how this works. I'm going to tell you, I, y'all are going to think this is weird, but I'm going to tell you how speaking works. How does speaking work? We all speak, but how does it work? Okay. So, some thoughts, because this is the way my brain processes. Number one, number one is this, you have thoughts, hopefully that lead to words. Now, psychologically, the average person has 6,000 thoughts a day. 6,000 unique thoughts a day, which if you're awake 16 hours, that is about six thoughts a minute. Some of you are way more than that. (laughs) Some of y'all way less. (laughs) But we have about 6,000 thoughts a day, and our thoughts are influenced by our emotions, by our surroundings, by what we see, by social media, by influencers, by our desire for pleasure and our desire to avoid pain. All those things influence us, right? So you have 6,000 of those babies a day, and according to the Bible, they are waging war within you. Okay, Romans 7, verses 22, 23 says this, For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. And you have all experienced this. The war within your mind. Those 6,000 thoughts that are saying, You should really go sit down and read the Bible. Oh, no, you should go watch television. All right? Stop scrolling and and pray. No, scroll more. 
right? And we, and we have these thoughts within us and you, you see people and you judge, right? You, you see announcements from companies that spend billions of dollars on marketing, and you, you desire, so you have the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life that are always at war within you against the spirit and against the scripture, right? That is always going on inside your head all the time. Can I, can I get a yes? Okay, I'll make sure I'm not the only one. I'm the only one, that's a thought. So you have thoughts. Secondly, your faith is the filter, hopefully. Your faith is a filter, and if your faith is weak and your biblical knowledge is low, then your filter's kind of cruddy, right? Just being real. So, a couple scriptures. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious for anything. Hmm, there, that's some really good uh, instructions. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So I have 6,000 thoughts a day, zing, bing, 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 bouncing around up here like pinballs. And then the scripture is my filter in which I... I'm submitting these things to the Lord, which I'll read in just a second. Up here, right? Have you guys ever been so anxious that there was no peace in your life? Hopefully not today, but yeah. Right? You have all the, you know, you have, you know, I'm gonna write a list of everything I'm stressed about. Oh my gosh. This, 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 these emails, these phone calls, this problem, this debt, this, but and you're just like your brain's getting ready to explode. Where's the peace of God? Well, it's supposed to be there. And if I learn how to pray and petition and give thanks and allow faith to be my filter, then the peace of God will be in my heart and in my mind. But we have to do the job of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6, which says this. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Verse 5 is important. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive, captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. How many thoughts do you have a day? How many apprehensions of thoughts are you having daily? And two. I captured two of them today and I was all, <laughs> right? So if I have 6,000 thoughts and some of them are righteous, Right? Oh, I should call. I... Yes, it is. Okay, this one stays. Is this a faith thought? Nope. You're gone. And we need to learn this. Okay? I want you to hear me say this. Undisciplined thinking will ruin your life. If you don't discipline your mind, your thought life, you let every one of those 6,000 thoughts run rampant through your brain, you ain't going to make it. He said, I'm not going to make it. Oh, my gosh. What am I going to do? I'm not going to make it. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Right? You need to learn to discipline your thoughts. And it, it happens every single day. You're looking, for, you're looking for a job. Is God big and, and is God able? Yes. So, Father, I just thank you for employment. I just thank you, Father, that you lead me and you guide me. I trust you. Those are all thoughts, and that is prayer. Or, 
I've applied everywhere and nobody wants me. I'm a terrible human. I'm useless. I am so not worth anything. I'm not going to get a job. I'm going to be homeless. I'm going to live under the bridge down my little Lutz Creek. <laughs> At least I can still go to church because it's close. Right? Those are negative thoughts based on lack of faith of God's ability to provide. Yes or no? Okay, And so I need to learn that my faith is my filter and what I put into my mind and what I put into my heart determines my filter. Okay, And some of you are way more concerned about Ben Affleck and J-Lo than you are about the Bible. Some of you are way more concerned about what Hollywood is doing instead of what the Holy Word is saying. Okay? You have memorized every Taylor Swift song, but you don't know the difference between the Apostle Paul and King Saul. I hate this pastor. He is so mean. Our faith is our filter, and the goodness, the, the filter is based on how you take care of it. Does that make sense? Man, we used to have a, we lived in Oklahoma, we had a above ground pool with a sand filter, right? It was like a big egg looking deal, and in Oklahoma is weird, and there's dirt, and oak, and pollen, and whatever, all this stuff. And Every year, after we had this pool for like 10 or 11 years, after a while, I just decided, you know what? On the 4th of July, every year, I am turning the pool off, emptying the sand, throwing it away, and putting in new sand, because it was cheaper than putting in chemicals. Okay? Because sand, I mean, whatever, pool sand. And so you spend a couple bucks on a couple bags of pool sand, and so I would empty it out, and it's like scrape, and it had green, gross, nasty junk in it. And by probably midday, I could get it all put back together in my little sand filter. Some of y'all are not taking care of your filter. And faith is your filter, and it's kind of green and moldy in there. You need to be reading your Bible and praying and worshiping and take care of your filter. All right. So, let's review. Number one, you have thoughts. Number two, faith is your filter. So number three, we choose words that express our thoughts through our filter. Right? You choose what you're going to say. How many of you ever think... Oh, I'm not going to say that. A couple, only two of you? <laughs> well, no wonder. <laughs> right? I mean, you, you, like you think something and then you're like, no, I ain't going to say that because I'm not going to start a fight. <laughs> right? So you choose your words. You decide whether you're going to hold on to a God thought or whether you're going to entertain an enemy thought and put it out there. All right? And sometimes when you're newly married, you just say everything. And then after a while, you realize this ain't worth fighting about. I ain't saying nothing. How was dinner? Delicious. <laughs> right? Do these pants make my butt look big? No, honey. You're amazing. Right? Because you don't want to get in. So you choose your words. Philippians 4.8 says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. There is implied in there a choice. I'm taking words captive and I'm tossing them. I'm taking words captive and I'm going to make thoughts captive. I'm going to make them into words to share with other people. That's a choice that I make. And it's important that we make this choice. Isaiah 55, 8 says, God speaks to Isaiah prophetically and he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And I think more and more today the Lord is like, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Right? Right? Neither are my ways your ways. 
And the Lord is not wanting you to sit in your thoughts and in your ways. You're, he's wanting you to figure out his thoughts and his ways and move up. Okay? And so, guys, it is dangerous for you not to have a disciplined thought life. And it is a danger for you if you choose not to speak properly. Okay? You're at work. And your supervisor comes in and says something to you, and everything in you is like, right? And, but you, instead of telling your boss, I'll meet you outside in the parking lot, you say, yes, sir, I'll work on that. You'll probably still have a job tomorrow. You'll probably still be able to pay the mortgage. See how that works? Right, and so there's there's a t we we choose what we're going to say because our, his ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. I have six thousand thoughts every day. I'm taking them captive, and I'm only going to speak what's righteous. Number four, at the end of the day, we say what we believe. What comes out of your mouth is what's really in your heart. What comes out of your mouth is what's in your heart, whether it's fear or whether it's faith. We choose it and we say it. Even if you're just blurting words out, which I highly don't recommend, what you say is what you really believe, what's really in your heart. Okay? I'm just going to take a moment. Here's a little parenthesis. Sarcasm is really what you believe, okay? Psychologically, we use sarcasm to make rude thoughts funny so that if the person doesn't like it, we can go, I was just kidding. But you really meant it because otherwise you wouldn't have said it because out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. Mm. There's that. So. Your words are always a representation of what's in your heart. Your words are always a rep representation of what is in your heart unless you are lying to yourself and operating in a place of deceit or deception. And then you're making words that are contrary to what you believe, and that creates chaos in your heart that is called cognitive dissonance, a whole nother sermon. Somewhere else, okay. Right, so if you don't believe in God, but you come and go, oh yeah, I believe in God, I'm a Christian, everything in your body is saying, you lie. Okay, that's cognitive dissonance, right? Oh, of course I love you. You don't love her. You're just trying to, you know, <laughs> you're lying. It's cognitive dissonance, okay? That's a like mental, emotional chaos. So when we analyze our speech, the words that come out of our mouths, we are, the words that come out of our mouths are reflecting the pain and the fear or ref reflecting the faith and the hope that we have in our hearts, is, is that all making sense? Okay. And, and in, a, in a way, the more you keep speaking the pain and the fear or the faith and the hope, you are prophesying your future. Okay. Please, please hear me. Okay. There was a time in, in spirit-filled Christianity where we would, um, you, you can have what you say and the, the blab it and grab it Christianity. No. Okay, that is a strong no. You're not walking over to the car dealer and prophesying that Corvette into your garage. <laughs> no. Okay? However, if you continue to say words, you are declaring what your future is going to be like. Let me explain. I coached little kids soccer for years, and there, were, there was always one kid on the team that was like the super kid. Right? It's like, oh, if he's here, we always win. And when that kid didn't show up, what did all the kids say? We're going to lose. It's going to be terrible. They're going to destroy us. And how did we play? Like that. 
right? Where if they had maybe said, well, you know, he's not here, but we're going to play our hardest and we're going to do good and, and we're, we're just going to do our best today. Well, they might win. Probably not, but they might win. But we do that to ourselves all the time, right? Oh, I'm going to ask her out on a date, but I know she's going to say no. Well, I would say no with an attitude like that. Right? I'm going to go apply for a job, although I won't get it. Right? I'm going to take this test, although I know I'm going to flunk it. So we, be, we begin to prophesy over ourselves and our pain and our negativity come out of our mouths because we're not taking thoughts captive. We need to begin to speak faith out of our mouths. Right? I'm choosing my words. I would rather you say nothing than speak negatively. Okay? But just begin to declare. You know, the Lord is with me, and he's going to give me the wisdom to figure this thing out. The Lord is on my side, and somehow he's going to open the door, and I will see this come to pass. Right? We need to begin to speak faith or speak nothing. One of our, uh, she's not here anymore, they moved away, but one of our dear members uh, years ago took a vow of silence for 30 days because she realized how negative her mouth was. Totally changed her life. People would talk to her and she'd be like, and she would walk away and you're like, But she learned in that process to keep her mouth shut and to not speak negativity and not speak doubt. And right now, she is uh, like an amazing, on fire woman of God, speaking faith. The transformation was amazing. I'm not recommending that for you, but if the Holy Spirit does, <laughs> you just go for that, okay? Why? Because number five, our words have power. Our words have power, often misused, but very true nonetheless. Proverbs 18, 21, the tongue has the power of life and death. Here's what I want you to see. Those who love it will eat it. Okay? So it's not blab it and grab it. It's you're a farmer and your words are seeds. And if you speak negativity, you will reap a harvest of negativity. Parents, if you're always talking to your kids and saying, little Johnny, you're just so dumb. (laughs) Well, guess what? Little Johnny's going to grow up thinking, I'm just dumb. Right? And you as a parent will eat the fruit of that because little Johnny's still living at home when he's 39 years old because he can't get a job because he's so dumb. It's your words in his life. Just saying, okay? So, (laughs) we will eat the fruit of our words. We will eat the fruit of our words. Galatians 6, 8, whoever sows to the... Sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit will, from the Spirit, reap eternal life. So you choose, okay? You can look at your investments and say, God is leading me and his hand is on it and we will do well. Or you will look at your investments and go, he's all going to die and shrivel up and be nothing. Those are your choices, Okay, I'm not saying that every investment is going to be great, but if you're speaking life over it, then you're in a position where the Holy Spirit can speak to you and you can change it. Right? And I mean, I can, we were sitting around the other day, we were talking to Elena. I like to have the discussion of if you had a time machine, discussion like we're driving down the street, driving down the highway, it's like, hey, if you had a time machine, what would you go back and change that discussion? And my answer was three stock investments that I made that cost me a million dollars loss. It's like, I would go back in time and tell myself, don't sell that. Buy more of that. Right? So if I am walking in faith and I'm, my heart is towards him and it's full of faith and full of hope, how about the Holy Spirit speaks to you and says, hey, don't sell that. 
hey, you should buy that. Do you think the Holy Spirit can do that? Absolutely. Do you think the Holy Spirit wants to bless you and have you walk in an abundance? Absolutely. No, I think the Holy Spirit doesn't like me and wants to crush me. Well, okay, well then listen to the message from the beginning. <laughs> okay? So our words have power. I want to, I want to wrap up with a, a brief illustration out of the book of Numbers. I'm sure you all know of it. When the Hebrews had walked around the desert for a short period of time, clan leaders, and he is sending them into the promised land to uh, spy out the land before they go in. This is before they wander for 40 years, right? God has led them out. He's destroyed the Egyptian army. He's, he's opened the Red Sea. He's provided for them. Everything's great. They're all carrying bags full of gold to, to build a new land. They have promises. It's great. And so they go into the promised land to spy, and they had so much negativity in their hearts that they talked themselves out of the blessing and into 40 years of wandering aimlessly around the desert, right? And so, let's see, where do I want to start reading? I'm in Numbers 13. Um, how about verse 27? They, the spies who are returning, gave Moses this account. We went into the land which you sent us. It does flow with milk and honey, and there is, and here is its fruit. And they pull out, I don't know, a grape the size of a basketball. Right? Here it is. There's fruit. It's awesome. But the people who live there are powerful. Their cities are fortified and very large. And when we saw the descendants of, of Anak... There, the Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. And then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we, are, we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't. We can't attack these people. They're stronger than we are. I guess they had, like, had a bench press competition and all the little Hebrew people lost. I mean, I don't know what it was, but they're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. And they said, the land we explored devours those living in it, which is a stupid statement. Because if it devoured the people living in it, then they would be devoured and the Hebrews would walk in scot-free. But no, we don't think that way. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim, CJ, there, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. And we, we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked the same to them, although they never talked to them to confirm it. You and I do this same thing. I got a promise. I got a grape the size of a basketball. I got milk. I got honey. I got a promise from the Lord. It's going to be amazing. We can do this. And then the other side of our thought life says, no, we can't. It's terrible. It's not going to work. We can't do this. It'll never happen. And we start talking ourselves out of the promise. And like the Hebrews that spent 40 years wandering in the desert and dying at a rate of approximately 25,000 funerals every day, we talk ourselves out of the goodness of God because we don't control our thought life. Because we don't speak our words, or choose our words to speak, and we don't speak faith, we speak fear. Okay? And so I want to bring all of this to you because I think we live in a time where there, there's a lot going on out there. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of news and there's a lot of negativity and it's going to only increase between now and November with the election. And there's just a lot going on. And we need to choose our meditations, and we need to choose our filter, and we need to choose the words that come out of our mouth, and there we will see a difference come this fall 
who will see who's in faith and who's in fear. Okay, I'm not talking about who's gonna win or who's not gonna win, whatever. I'm talking about are you staying in faith and keeping your heart right before the Lord? That's the win. Are you staying in faith and keeping your heart right before the Lord? That's the win that we need to see in our, in our church family. Okay? And so I just don't focus on all the negatives because there are some. Focus on the promise and the promise giver and begin to walk in what he has for you. Okay, so can we take a moment and we pray over this? Okay, so you can put your stuff down, close your Bibles up, and maybe put your hand on your heart because out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. And so, so Father, this morning we submit our hearts to you. We submit our hearts to you, Lord, knowing that our, our mind has thousands of thoughts every day and we entertain them in our hearts. And Father, I pray that this morning we would be able to lay down the fear and lay down the negativity and lay down the pain before you. And Father, we choose to think about things that are good and things that are righteous and things that are noble. Father, we choose to think about things that are faith-filled. Father, our meditation is on Jesus today. Our meditation is on what Jesus desires to do in us and through us. And Father, as our nation walks into this election season, political season of the next five or so months, Father, let us be, let us be a lighthouse. Father, I pray that when we are, we are at work or we're at school or we're around our neighbors and, and people are whining and complaining, Father, let us choose our words wisely and be full of faith. Father, I recognize that regardless of what may happen in Washington, Jesus is still on the throne. And Lord God, I ask that Jesus will be on the throne of each of our hearts in this room. Father, we love you. And I pray that our words would reflect the love of Jesus. I pray, Father God, that our words would reflect the scripture. Father, let the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you, Lord. Let the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you, Lord. Father, this morning, if some of us in this room are struggling with, with evil or wicked meditations, lust-filled meditations. Father God, we lay those things at your feet right now in the name of Jesus. Just right where you are, just silently, just unpack that and give that to the Lord. Lord, I give you the, the lust of the flesh. Lord, I give you the pride of life. I just lay it down at your feet. Lord, I give you the lust of the eyes. I lay it at your feet. Father, I just thank you for freedom that comes from that in Jesus' name. Yes. Father, I pray that, Holy Spirit, I just ask you to touch the people that are listening to my voice that love, they love the drama. They'll say things to stir it up and love the drama. Father, I just pray that you would bring healing to their hearts right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we don't need to be the center of the attention. Jesus needs to be the center. So, Father, help us to pull ourselves out of, out of the center of it all and let it be Jesus. Because we just whisper the name Jesus. Lord, we need you. Lord, we need you in our, our thoughts. We need you in our hearts. We need you in our, our mouths. Now more than ever. Father, we thank you for doing a new work in us. Father, teach us to train our brain to think godly things. Teach us to train our hearts for godly meditations. And Father God, we thank you for the victory in those areas in our lives. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Awesome. I'm going to ask if you're on our prayer team, if you would 
be so kind as to just jump up here real quick at the, uh, to the altar. Um, if you need prayer for stuff in your life today, you got relationship stuff going on, you have, I don't know, financial needs, you, whatever it is, you got stuff and you're like, I just really need someone to pray with me. Folks up here at the altar that would love the opportunity to pray with you, pray for your healing, pray for your freedom, pray for, for life. And so I'm just going to ask you to, to, if that's you, as we dismiss, just come up and, and ask them to pray over you. So uh, let's stand to our feet. We're going to be dismissed. So Father God, we thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word is amazing. And I pray, Father God, that this morning we would honor you. And as we go from this place, let us eat the fruit of our words. And we thank you for it, Father. Bless this people. Bless us as we go. Father, let us be light everywhere we go this week. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to receive prayer, come on up. Receive prayer. Uh, you are dismissed. If you brought kids, go pick them up before you go home.